Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We have assembled a very impressive panel to discuss managed care outpatient trends. One housekeeping matter before we begin. As you know, this presentation is being pre-recorded, so we will not be able to answer your questions in real time. However, not. If you have questions, jot them down, and after the presentation, you will have the ability to email the questions to us, and we will do our best to respond to you as quickly as possible. So let's begin by introducing our panelists. In alphabetical order, first we have Randy Blum, the Vice President of Managed Care for Catholic Health, an integrated system on Long Island encompassing six acute care hospitals, three nursing homes, a home health service, hospice, and a network of physician practices. His responsibilities include development of payer strategies, and contract negotiations. Randy brings with him to the provider side over 20 years of experience on the payer side. Prior to joining Catholic Health this past August, he spent four years at Health First, where he last served as its vice president, delivery system engagement. And prior to that, he spent 15 years at United Health Group, where he held a number of positions, including vice president, network management, New York market lead. Andy is a graduate of Binghamton University, where he majored in math and economics and is a certified actuary. Next up, we have Brent Estes, the Senior Vice President and Chief Managed Care Officer of the Mount Sinai Health System. In this role, Brent provides executive oversight for administrative, contracting, and financial performance of value-based risk and fee-for-service contracts. He works with the health system finance team to drive the system's overall revenue strategy and with its population health leadership to shape the value-based agreement strategy and drive performance. Brett came to Mount Sinai from Chicago where he most recently served as Senior Vice President Business Development at Advocate Aurora Health. Brent earned his degree from University of North Texas and he is a Dallas Cowboy fan. We will not hold that against. Last but not least, we have Kareem Habibi the Senior Vice President and Chief of Managed Care at NYU Langone Health. Kareem's responsibilities include the development and execution of managed care strategies on behalf of the hospital and over 3,700 employed physicians. Kareem directs the managed care contracting efforts for fee-for-service and value-based contracts. The value-based contracts encompass hospital quality-based contracts, bundled payment programs, and ACO-like payment arrangements across the various payers covering over half a million attributed lives. Kareem is also responsible, responsible for providing management services for an IPA of approximately 2,500 physicians. Kareem has over 35 years of healthcare experience and holds a Master of Science in Health Services Management from NYU and a Master of Public Health in, in, health, in health Administration from the University of Oklahoma. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I personally have relationships with all of you, and you really are the tops of your field. So let's get going. And Kareem, why don't we start with you and talk to us about what you've seen in the New York market or for the last 35 years in the, in the, trend, in the trend of the movement of services from inpatient to outpatient. Thank you, Deb. Um, yeah, over over the years, what we've seen uh, in the New York market is uh, transition from inpatient to outpatient. I remember back in the mid nineties when uh, I joined one of the orthopedic hospitals, we, a laminectomy used to stay in the hospital for seven days. So now 95% of the laminectomies, these back surgeries are done outpatient, just to tell you. And, uh, and this transition in terms of site of care from inpatient and outpatient is primarily driven uh, early on by the payers, mostly on the commercial market. Uh, the younger patients were able to move quicker into the outpatient setting. But more importantly, it is, you know, as much as you believe clinical should be driving the site of care transition, it's, it's all about the money. So when CMS, for example, changed the site of care policy, in 2018, moving a knee replacement, uh, taking the knee replacement procedure from the inpatient only list, which meant they were only be done in, uh, in an inpatient setting, and 2019, the hip replacement, 
you've seen a huge transition of these total joint replacements across the country. And uh, hospitals who used to capture 100% of that volume on the inpatient side now probably are capturing a third of that on inpatient and the other two thirds are split between hospital based outpatient setting and uh, ASCs. Uh, and we're going to continue to see this trend to accelerate as Medicare eventually over time uh, will eliminate this inpatient only list. Thanks. Brent, you want to add to that? Is there a difference in the market from what you saw in Chicago as to what we're seeing here um, in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut area? Uh, no, Deb. I think uh, the experience that I've observed in and other markets, including Chicago, is very similar to what Kareem described here in New York. Uh, over the years, there has been a, a, a steady change inside of service with things moving from inpatient to hospital outpatient, and then from hospital outpatient to ambulatory surgery, um, other types of ambulatory care moving into the home setting. So I think it's an exciting time for health systems and other providers to think about how to invest uh, in those opportunities to make sure they're able to capture as much of a patient's health healthcare wallet as possible. So Randy, I'm going to ask you to put back your put back on your payer hat and take us from the payer perspective in in what a payer thinks about in moving business. Is it strictly cost for moving business from inpatient to outpatient? And perhaps you can discuss a little bit on the distinction between a hospital outpatient department and a freestanding ASC. Remember, this audience is primarily ASC. And so from a legal perspective, and this is just my opinion, um, but there is nothing from a legal perspective that is different from a hospital outpatient department versus a freestanding ASC. But in reality, right, both, both have to be certified by the New York State uh, under New York State Public Health Law, the same certification process under Article 28. But that's not how the market sees it. And so I'd like you to, can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think to Kareem's point, it is primarily driven by cost. Um, you know, historically, ambulatory surgery centers are paid less than hospitals for the same services. And obviously, a procedure performed in a hospital outpatient is paid at reimbursed at a lower rate than something that's in an inpatient basis. And, you know, so Kareem made the point, it usually starts with something from a regulatory perspective or from CMS when they say, okay, geez, this service is now safely able to be provided on an outpatient basis and the payers will jump on them. I mean, Risa, an example, something that just came out this week, not related to ambulatory surgery, but that uh, I forget with who put it out, but said that now many services that are billed under observation don't even need, patients don't even need observation. They could be just regular ER treatment release. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a lot of payers jump on that immediately and now start to review observation cases to downgrade to, to emergency. I, I think that's because it's lower cost. So, I mean, it is driven by cost. Um, they look for, you know, some kind of credi credible publication that says it's, it's safe to move something from the inpatient to the outpatient or, and then, you know, to your point, outpatient department of a hospital is, from a, you know, from a legal and probably from a clinical perspective, not that much different than a freestanding ambulatory surgery center, but from a payer's perspective, it's cheaper. So they they try to push as, they're trying to push as much utilization they can out of the hospital and into a freestanding center. I mean, that, that's a trend that's been going on for many years and I'm, I'm sure we're just gonna see that continue. So I've seen on behalf of our clients, these site of service policies, that the plans try to take the concept of medical necessity and kind of shoehorn, shoehorn in site of service, where cost becomes a component of medical necessity. Brian, I see you shaking your head. How has, has Mount Sinai tried to address that those types of policies where as, as Randy said, clinically, it, there's really not much of a distinction between a hospital outpatient department and a freestanding ASC. It is actually about cost. Yeah, I think we definitely have seen the payers try to uh, embed cost as a part of the definition of medical necessity and 
we frankly have pushed back pretty hard on that in those cases. We don't feel like cost should be a major driver in determining sighted service, that the physician along with their patient should be able to decide the best appropriate sighted service for the care that they that they need. Um, we certainly recognize that you know there are cost pressures on employers and, and payers and consumers and are happy to do you know, you know what we can to facilitate you know access to appropriate low cost care, but um, we don't agree that cost should be a principal uh, deciding factor in determining sighted service. Graham, anything you want to add? Yeah, to your point, Deb, uh, we had to deal with one large payer in our marketplace, and the twist wasn't, uh, they didn't call it cost based, they just called it quality based, where it was horrendous for the patient to have an ambulatory surgery in an OR house inside the hospital premises, while it was much safer to have it in an ASC, because if they walked in the hospital, it was presented like they have gonna have all kinds of infections. So what worked in our favor is NYU invested for years in freestanding ambulatory surgery. I mean, in the rest of the country, anytime you have ORs outside your main hospital, they call the ASCs, except in New York. It all depends whether those are in your CON of the hospital or not. So all of our facilities, and this is where we have proven to that players, are freestanding. And if those satisfy your needs, uh, we should do our procedures there. And uh, that helped us position the argument. And uh, NYU does like 50% of all their outpatient surgery surgeries in uh, what you call freestanding ambulatory surgery centers. And uh, the only ones we tend to do in the main hospital uh, operating rooms uh, whenever, even sometimes a colonoscopy when the patient have high risk. So in case they uh, need to have something more critical procedure done, that's why we do it in these places. Otherwise we do them in the ASCs. Do you think, and anyone feel free to answer, do you think that the shift, and I read something that over the past 10 or 15 years, there's been a 20% shift from hospital outpatient department over to freestanding ASCs. Do you think we've reached a point of equilibrium or is there still gonna be pressure to move outpatient procedures from uh, hospital outpatient departments to ASCs? I, I, you know, it all goes back to my earlier comment. Is, so as more policies are done by the government, to push more inpatient to outpatient, that's going to continue to fuel uh, more movement from uh, inpatient to outpatient-based uh, hospital versus ASCs. And with you know, I was reading something uh, a few days ago, uh, e even in the hip and knee replacement. And the reason why Medicare obviously hit uh, these procedures is this is their largest spend actually on inpatient. So. Uh, and by just moving them from inpatient to outpatient, they cut the reimbursement anywhere, depending on which market you are, because all of these reimbursement rates are wage adjusted. And depending whether you add uh, uh, the GME into the numbers, uh, so you go from paying $18,000 to something like $12,000, right? I mean, uh, just by doing the same procedure in a different setting. Uh, and we already seen uh, just from 18 and 19 for that uh, kind of procedure, which when I entered healthcare, I never thought that would be done ever on outpatient. Uh, already two thirds of them migrated to outpatient and ASCs on a national basis are capturing really a third of those uh, already. And a third and 80% of that population is the commercial population where they're capturing, where hospitals are still capturing uh, uh, you know the you know the governmental ones like Medicare and it's also a challenge as 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 you lose patients from inpatient to outpatient this is something for hospitals to deal with the way Medicare build their reimbursement they have what they call IME and direct medical education built into your procedures and then you have a direct medical education component which is settled through the cost report and that's all based on patient volume. And those were intended to train residents, medical education purposes, and so forth. And as you start, continue to lose your inpatient volume, uh, that's a big problem for hospitals, especially teaching hospitals like us in order to continue maintaining our mission. So there's going to be a different thought process on how we tie these things into outpatient as well or uh, 
create some sort of an allocation to the hospitals uh, independent of the volume of patients they do. Interesting. I never thought about the impact it can have on medical education. Do um, does, do residents rotate through your ASCs, Brent, do you know? Or Randy? I, I don't know that. Yeah, yeah, I'm not aware we, either. We do. You do, you, you rotate? Yeah, we, ro we, we rotate them, we rotate them. And actually, I mean, the whole program, NYU was, I think one of the, if not the first uh, ones to change their uh, medical education. And now, you know, going from four year medical school to three year medical school uh, by uh, renovating and packaging things. And uh, I've seen that even my son going through medical school, his fourth year, you know, especially the last semester, it's just, uh, they didn't do much, right? So, so, and there's a huge need and demand for physicians, then how do you uh, restructure the teaching piece and starting having doctors now, for example, uh, training them even uh, in an uh, office space where we, you know, a lot of our physicians are employed, we have practices and put them on the front because a lot of these patients, the way they were trained inside the hospital, not taking care, of, you know, in, uh, in uh, physician offices, for example, give them the exposure there and be able to expedite inventions so that, you know, uh, in terms of technology and things, you know, so he's talking about education and research and teaching. So you mentioned hospital, um, hospital, sorry, physician office-based practices. We saw the trend, we're seeing the trend from hospital-based outpatient departments to freestanding ASCs. Do ASCs have to be concerned about watching um, procedures move from ASCs now to hospital-based? I keep saying that, I'm sorry, physician office-based. Do we, do we see, is that a risk that, they, that ASCs need to be concerned about? I think so. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, there's always the, the plans are always looking for the next thing that will lower costs, right? So even if, so once you kind of move things from the inpatient to outpatient, outpatient to ambulatory surgery center, what's the next thing that might cost less money? That's the ability for a physician to perform a service in their office. So I, I do, I see that coming. Um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put anything, I wouldn't take anything off the table. I mean, and I, I don't mean that in a bad way. I have, you know, spent the majority of my career on the health plan side. I mean, I, I think that they're always looking for ways to lower costs. It's interesting because we're representing three large hospital systems talking about how we're trying to protect our volume. And as you mentioned, the majority of the audience represents ambulatory surgery centers there. It's the opposite, right? They're benefiting at least for the short for the time being, they're benefiting from these policies because the payers are trying to push more utilization for them. So it's it's just an it's always there's always going to be the next thing that the payers are looking to try to push costs down. So I, I I definitely see things moving in that direction. So let's talk about cost and reimbursement. Try now we'll we'll think that we're wearing our ASC hats when they're facing payers. Right, what do what they should be thinking about in terms of reimbursement methodologies, the various types of reimbursement methodologies, and perhaps protecting the migration of services from ASCs to office-based. So I know let's let's start first with reimbursement methodologies. Um, Brent, you know, what what do you see as as the way that an ASC should approach reimbursement with the payer? It's a good question. Um, I think there's certainly a lot of methodologies, you know, out there. Uh, I personally would caution against sort of a standard grouper methodology, where you know various things are just sort of lumped into uh, broad categories. I think a more effective way of thinking about pricing is to really understand the scope of services that you're providing and uh, really focus on either carve outs or specific case rates for things that you know are going to be higher volume and where you have higher costs. Uh, different ways to approach the payers with regard to things like implantable devices. Um, so depending on you know procurement you know strategies and what your actual costs are for that, you can handle that a few different ways. Kareem? Like anything else, you need a methodology. So obviously, uh, 
first, you need to make sure the payer can administer the methodology that you have in mind and they can work with you. But uh, tweaking a methodology that a payer presents to you, I think you should account for two things. One is your current business. Uh, as Brent, I agree, you can do carve-outs to address your existing volume. But at the same time, the rest of your business is going to default to a standard methodology that the payer has. And you want to make sure you don't undercut yourself because today, your contract works for the colonoscopies and maybe eye procedure you're doing, and maybe in, down the line you're going to add musculoskeletal or uh, you know orthopedic procedure. You want to make sure your contract be able to support them down the line. So, so you're going to be open-minded to figure something that could work for you, uh, short terms as, as well as the long term, and uh, and suggested approach always to carve out like expensive technology items. So drugs, for example, if you happen to use drugs in your ASC, uh, you know, the cost of drugs has been increasing in double digits. So you want to be able to have to get paid for those separately at a different methodology, whether it's ASP, Medicare, AWP, plus a percentage, whatever you can negotiate. And uh, the other item is implants. Uh, because today you can have, and you know, even though you might have exclusivity for new technology in your contract, uh, if you have a, a cataract lens today that costs you $500 and tomorrow you, there's something invented uh, uh, that makes your eyes color blue as well as attracts your cataract and costs $5,000 from a payer perspective, that's not considered new technology, right? So this is just an improvement on existing one. And even if you have language to protect you, you're not going to be able to open the contract. So if you keep it as a pass through, uh, that will protect you down uh, the line and to the future. Randy, are there certain types of reimbursement methodologies? I know I'm seeing one payer, um, OPPS, the outpatient perspective payment system that is, is more complicated or harder to work with than, you know, I don't know, bundles or APG methodology, anything that you would uh, say stay away from? Um, you know, it's, it's, I think most, for the most part, payers have their own standard methodology. I think that some of them are okay using the percentage of Medicare using AP, APCs. Some have their own groupers, as Brent mentioned. And, in my experience, and you know that this might be a different conversation with a hospital system who's negotiating on behalf of a ASC as opposed to an ASC who's just going in by themselves. The payers are usually not as flexible on the methodology if an ASC is just going in there to negotiate on the on their own without you know being backed by a hospital set per se because I think they want to make sure that they can administer. You know, I think the comment came up earlier, uh, Kareem mentioned it. They want to make sure they can administer it and they want to keep the variations to a minimum. So each, each payer is going to be different. I think, yes, I agree with what Brent said. If there are specific services that you know are high volume or you suspect are going to be high volume in the, in the coming years, I would definitely recommend having those carved out of those groupers at a higher fee. Um, try to get as much as you can upfront because uh, the payers are not generous with escalators on ambulatory surgery centers. So I think, you know, you, you have to try to get as much as you can upfront while I think balancing the fact that you need to be cheaper than the hospital and the outpatient. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for if they're able to, if you're able to have more utilization, you're saving the payer money. That's really the whole, the whole idea. And so there has to be that balance between trying to have your rates be as high as possible, as possible, but also being cheaper than a the same service being performed at your the hospital that's down the block or two blocks away. So your va value-based proposition. Make sure that your ASC has a, a very clear value-based proposition when you're facing the plans. Similarly, so Randy, based on what you just said, I guess you would be for recommending perhaps a fixed three-year term or as far out as you can go with rates that that um, maybe there's an escalator, maybe not, but at least you know for, you know, there's no without cause termination during a fixed term longer than a year to protect that business that, um, that you're trying to capture. Yeah, I mean, and I think you should, you know, push 
even if it's a low escalator, I've seen, you know, a lot of the payers, like I said, are not very generous with freestanding centers. Even if it's a couple of percent, you should take it. Don't, I think, don't stand on ceremony and say that's not enough. Um, you know, you want to have something in there that at least your rates are, are going up. And then you could always go back and renegotiate a contract two, three years from now. But I've seen a lot of providers forego something because they think that something is, is not a, a not enough. And I, I recommend to the folks in the crowd, take take what you can get and you could always go back later and try to get more. But don't don't push out getting something done because you're not happy with the two percent escalator that they wanted because you want three or four. You should, you know, lock in what you can and you know, you could always take another bite of the apple next year or two years from now. Fred, do you have anything to uh to add to Randy's last comment? No, I think those were great comments. Uh, what I was thinking about, and we don't really have anybody from uh, the payer side of the industry here on the panel, but you know, my experience and observation has been with the payers that they're often, you know, hesitant to really um, invest uh, reimbursement into emerging and growing alternate sites of care. And in my opinion, it's a little penny wise and pound foolish, you know, because I think payers should want providers to be able to be successful in these other sites of, Sarah, uh, sites of care and to sort of, you know, handle it on the cheap doesn't really give people a lot of um, enthusiasm and excitement about investing in these things. So we've seen it in ambulatory surgery, we've seen it in home care, you know, home infusion, you know, sort of across the board. So, you know, our hope is payers will be more willing to pay more for those services in order to make sure that they're viable, you know, in the future. Kareem, any other comments before we move on? Yeah, again, I mean, I uh, reemphasize what I said earlier. The more you can exclude from the main rates items that are growing at the double digit increases, whether it's an expensive implant you an ASC could be using or a drug, then to uh, Randy's point on the cola, you could be, be able to accept a little lower if you have to. I mean, but given the inflationary pressures we're facing, so basically, What's tied to the quarter would become only your labor costs, right? Increase and in benefits. So that's what you, you you could play with. At least if you're able, you're able to negotiate ex exclusions of certain uh, supply items and implants from uh, drugs. That would uh, go a long way to help you uh, live with a lower cola instead of asking for eight percent based on inflation or whatever. Next, I wanted to ask the three of you about population health and more specifically um, innovative payment arrangements involving ASCs. Have you seen bundled payments where the ASCs are actually responsible to include in the price of their services, anesthesia, laboratory, pathology, um, the, surgical, the surgical fees? Is that something that is becoming more popular? You know who wants to uh, to begin? I I personally have not seen that. I think even in our dealings with the payers around the concepts of centers of excellence for things like joint replacement and certain spine surgery, it doesn't really matter what the site of services. Their administrative infrastructures just are not set up, up to efficiently manage a true bundle payment. Um, and so I think that is an opportunity, you know, in the industry to kind of develop, you know, that. But um, you know, trying to combine physician bills and hospital bills into one, you know, payment rate has a lot of challenges. I think on the on the administrative side, both for the both for the providers and for the and for the payers. Randy, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I haven't seen that. W one thing that when you ask that question, that I while it's not a bundled payments per se, many of the payers have do put have provisions in the agreements that will. Call, let's call it a penalty for lack of a better term for you know ensuring that the anesthesiologists who, who work at the centers, the pathologists are participating in their in their network. So I think that's something that you should, you know, as I'm talking to the, the crowd here, I think that's something you should ensure that the other <clears throat> other provide the providers who are working at your service 
participate in in the payers networks because that then they'll they'll be if they're not they'll be unanticipated costs and then they're the payers will end up coming after you for to either for a penalty or to try to renegotiate the contract or you know in an extreme circumstance potentially terminate you from the network because you know again the, the whole idea is to have lower costs and if you're using a non-participating anesthesiologist in your center those costs are significantly higher than participating so while it's not a bundled cost per se it does the payers do look at that so it, they look at it as a total in, in, in total cost of care in that way <clears throat> Well, thank you, Randy. You've now just given me the opportunity to make a plug for having your contracts reviewed before you sign them. Because in terms of penalties, I, um, I am a managed care attorney, as the three of you well know, and I think some of the audience knows as well. I don't believe in penalties. And they, they should not be in a contract. If, if a plan wants to incent a center for only using in-network providers, that is fine. And they can also mandate it because it's, again, in the world of managed care, it's usually the payer's bat ball and rules. But in terms of, of impact on your reimbursement and paying money back, ASC should be very careful to make sure the contract clearly states that if they provide the service that was pre-authorized and they provided it, they get paid for it. Um, if there is a problem with use of out-of-network providers, it can be teed up as a breach. It can be handled in other ways. It should not be handled as an economic penalty. Maybe there's there's incentive, I think, for plan. I'm all for positive reinforcement and not negative reinforcement. I, I If a plan wants to say, hey, if, if all the providers that you use are participating, we're going to add a kicker. You know, you're going to get an extra one or two points or whatever but I would never want to see any client of mine having to pay back money for services provided by somebody else, right? That, that is something that to me is sacrosanct. And I think I'm happy to say, I don't think I've ever reviewed a contract that has permitted a penalty. It's just one of those things like medically necessary covered services get paid, right? If you fail to dot an I or cross a T, shouldn't have to pay back that money. But again, that's when I get on my soapbox um, doing this a very long time. But the thing about ASC, the, the services provided in ASC, they're always elective. And pretty much they're, they always come from, from my understanding, there's always a pre-authorization. So you don't have the exposure that you know hospitals do on emergency admissions or observation services that where things can become where, where it's not necessar necessarily true that the hospital is gonna get paid for the services they provide because of some of the plan rules. Um, you know, in terms of interesting, I thought I'm surprised by your, your answers regarding bundled payments because I actually have done a bundled payment arrangement. I've done two this past year in New Jersey, dealing with a single specialty ASC taking care of the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, and the amp surge rate, and did it with a major payer, um, not necessarily in New York, but a, a payer outside of New York that is really being innovative. And my understanding, it's going quite well. Quite well. It, it was um, an interesting contract. In, in my dealing with payers, on the pop health side or the value-based payment arrangement side, where there is a sense that there is quality being delivered along with a, a payment mechanism that kind of puts the parameters around cost, the plans have been um, pretty good to deal with. I mean, I, there's been a whole lot less tension in that arena. Kareem, I don't know, has, has NYU done bundled payments? It was done with Medicare. Uh, and obviously CMS is the one who set the landscape here through BPCI and others, and all the payers really follow the same terms and tweak it here and there. But going back to the ASC question, so here we started this conversation uh, and Randy, when he wore his uh, payer hat saying, expect to give a big discount because you gotta be, need to be cheaper than the hospital. We know 
how Medicare pay them what, 60% of the hospital based outpatient rate or something like this. So I just have a hard time. Why would you do bundled payment to take further risk where you're cheaper? And I hope you're not discounting your rate further to accomplish what here? And on outpatient, uh, I mean, doing bundled just for the procedure itself, or we're talking about 30 days after, 60 days after. Uh, if this comes with steering more volume, that's a different discussion. But if this is coming like do business the same way, I mean, it just makes no sense to me. That yeah. So one thing I did do in terms of the bundled payment, it was for a certain amount of time post procedure. You can draft the contract to carve out certain services, like anything requiring a hospital ER visit or another surgery outside of the ASC. There are ways to structure the contract to limit risk, but um, I thought it was going to be something that we would see more of. So, uh, you know, it's interesting for me to hear, you know, the three of you because clearly you do have a have a you have your finger on the pulse. What's happening in in our market? Um, we're coming close to the end. Is there anything else that you feel that we haven't discussed? Any last minute words of wisdom for ASCs or for other hospital providers that have are facing this, you know, the migration of services away from hospitals to ASCs? The only thing I, I would add, you know, we talked about value based. I, I do think there is definitely there's a place for ASCs in value-based arrangements with payers, right? Most of the top, most of most of the value-based arrangement with payers are centered around, you know, a, a PCP, a member being assigned to a PCP, looking at the total cost of care for that member. And obviously, since we're talking about lowering costs, that could involve, you know, working with those provide with the providers to migrate services to a lower cost of care. And I, Again, we're represent. We three of us represent hospitals, so that's not necessarily a good thing for for our bottom line. But in terms of lo lowering costs, ASC is potentially participating in value based arrangements to the extent that they are working with providers who may have value based arrangements with payers and can, you know, want to piece of the pie, for lack of a better term, for utilization that's shifted. That saves money. For the payers, there might, you know, there's potentially an opportunity for them to get a bonus payment for that as well. That still results in kind of a win-win for everybody, maybe except the hospitals, perhaps. But we are talking about ASC. We are. We are. I always say when we're doing these clinically integrated network agreements, ACO agreements, the hospital becomes your largest cost center. So it is um it's tough on the hospital system. Brent, any final words for our audience? No, I don't think so. This has been a great discussion. Thank you for moderating. Thank you for participating. And Kareem? Nothing more to add here. Uh, again, thank you for uh, inviting me here. And I hope I uh, gave some good tips. Thank you again, all three of you. Um, and thank you to our audience again when we Hang up, you'll have the opportunity to send over some questions and we'll get back to you by email. Thank you all. Have a great day. You too.